bring Timmy the trash can. And I love trash. Popcorn boxes, cups, and candy wrappers. Mmm, they all taste so good. Instead of throwing your trash on the floor, won't you please give it to me? Thank you for considering your fellow patrons. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tim Dillon Show bonus episode. Ray Comp will be in next week. I apologize for misleading you. My trip to New York City got postponed. Next week, I'm going to New York. We will get Raymond. We want him in the flesh. You can't just have Ray, uh, you know, on Skype or through a phone. You need actual Ray. You need to feel his spittle landing on the microphone and on my face <laughs> while he launches into a diatribe about his newest rash. <laughs> I said to him, I was in New York, and I said, what's going on? He's like, listen, listen, I got a rash. It's been taken care of. <laughs> like he was angry. So it's been taken care of. I'm like, okay. <laughs> in his place, in his stead. Is that, a, is that a term, in his stead? In his stead, the host, the co-host of the Mormon and the Meth Head podcast. Uh, you've heard her on This Is Not Happening with Ari Shafir. You've heard her on Birdcast. You've heard her on Dr. Drew After Dark, where you were going to hear me, but I didn't show up. <laughs> Hopefully you guys have listened to the uh, the episode and you know by now, but spoiler alert, I did not show up and I got myself in a, a little pickle with my lying. But I'm sure they said, they reached out to me and said, by the way, it's fine. It made us laugh. We'll have you back. No date. No new date. So we'll see. Um, the great Jessa Reed Hello. is with us. Thank you. You didn't tell me that I was replacing Ray. I mean, they're going to be so disappointed. No, I mean, they know it's coming. Yeah, they know Ray's going to come, but they love you, too. People request you. They like you. They're, your This Is Not Happening is in the top five that has been done on that show. Thank you. Thank 100%. you. 100%. It's about how Jessa used to drink her own pee <laughs> made of <laughs> methamphetamine. Alert. You know? So if you don't know who Jessa is, go watch... Her This Is Not Happening on YouTube right now. And uh, Jess is one of my only friends in L.A. You're uh, my there, only friend there is, in there L.A. Are, as, there, ben, there are cobwebs in this ashtray. <laughs> I mean, does that matter? No, he I just needs to smoke more. I mean, it's really... I quit smoking, so there's... I know, but there's no lighters in the house. <laughs> like the whole... This is a kid who used to smoke a pack a day. Now there's 20 vapes. You can't... There's no matches anywhere. <laughs> But there's 45 vapes. His chick is now doing vapes. She's never smoked in her life. She's on vapes. Everybody's, by the way, you know, you're dying too, right? With yeah, the vapes. Yeah, of course. There's no way the piece of plastic or metal you put in your mouth that glows is good. <laughs> um, is this a buzzkill that my uncle died? He died. Uh, last week. Yeah, and they tell said, that story. They said Does because he, that was he just went swimming, right? He went swimming. Guy, sixty years old, goes swimming, comes back, has an ear infection, Ugh. and just I could feel that there was something wrong, and I was right. like, you need to go to the hospital. And he said, I don't have insurance. And I said, Well, go to urgent care. It's one hundred and twenty bucks. And he was like, I just don't have insurance. And I was like, I know, but urgent care is like 120 bucks. And then he just said, when I get home, I'll try to get insurance. And I was like, all right, I guess he doesn't have 120 bucks. I didn't want to embarrass him. Turns out he couldn't fucking hear anything I was saying because his ears were so plugged up. So he was just like feeding me the same line over and over again. Didn't hear me say anything about urgent care. Goes home. Almost dies in his living room, calls the ambulance, goes back. They put him in a coma. Anyway, he died. But yeah, Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaires? But, but yeah. Where did he go swimming? Just somebody's pool, which I guess like you can get like that bacteria is all over the place. But hey, like somebody's like backyard pool. Yeah. They got to feel bad about that. Huh? Yeah. Well, that's got to be awkward now. His, what's his name? Well, it's not awkward. He's gone. Well, what? I that might be. Well, no, not his full name. But what's his name? Like Mike. Joe. Yeah, Mike. sorry, Mike. Yeah, well, what are they going to say? The people that he went swimming, they can't go. Hey, how's Mike? <laughs> he was at our. He was at the barbecue. 
Um, so that sucks. He had a lung disease. He had a lung infection first, though, which is what made him susceptible to the Legionnaire's disease. And they said, we need your vape cartridges because there are all these mysterious lung infections breaking out all over the country. And it's from the vapes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Dr. Drew, when I was on there, said they're safe. He was like almost advertising them. Dr. Drew, with all due respect, will say anything if you shove money in his mouth. <laughs> Let's be honest. If you put a, 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 some cold, hard cash in that guy's mouth, he'll tell you heroin is safe. If, if, the, if the fucking Medellin cartel sponsors his show, he'll talk about cocaine being an effective cough suppressant, which it was used for in the 1800s. Stanhope has the greatest bit on him. Stanhope's like, how do you get to be a celebrity rehab specialist. Dan Hope's like, that's being a gynecologist and going like, yeah, I only is, I specialize in Norwegian 18 uh, year old stinkless pussy. <laughs> Stan Hope had the best bit about that. Like, how does that even happen? But I, I respect Drew and I'll see him soon. Hopefully. <laughs> um, You're batting a thousand. I'm batting a thousand. <laughs> I doubt he'll sign up for the Patreon. So you're well, probably who fine. knows? I love Patreon because you can talk all the shit you want. And uh, listen, odds are how. So I feel bad, man. Legionnaire's disease. It's fucking rough. It was super rough because my mom went there yeah. and like there was no babysitter for like 10 days. We were also telling her mother he was going to be fine. Remember yeah. I was over your house. Yeah. We go. He's going to. Now, by the way, I, I, I what do I know? Right. <laughs> I know nothing. I have no medical background at all. Jessa wasn't saying much because she's more plugged in energy and in tune with shit. So she's like, well, go kiss him and love him. And I said, hey, he's going to be great. He'll get right out of there in a day. Like, 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 like I have some inside info. And a week later, he checks out. Yeah. Well, it's, that is very, that is unfortunate. And, you know, it is, uh, you know, that is what happens, sadly. It didn't take me long to adjust to this podcast. No, I love you. Come in with, you come in with the positive. You come in right away with the good stuff. Poor guy goes, swims in a backyard pool. It's all over. You know? Uh, now, that just goes to show you. I just want to scare Ben. Yeah. If you want to survive, don't have friends. <laughs> I don't oh, get I invited bet it anywhere. Was an up, and an I'm above still ground here. Pool. It had to have been an above ground it pool, It was right? absolutely an above ground <laughs> pool. That was probably just filmy piss water <laughs> splashing around in it. As soon as he got in it, he was probably like, why did I even fucking do this? Why am I here? There's nothing worse than an ear infection. No. You well, know? you can put onion juice in your ear and get rid of it really quick. What Am I is- on a hill? Am I in a wheeled chair uh, on a hill? Do you want like a stable chair and I'll take the office <laughs> chair? <laughs> can you get her a real chair, please? This is what we do with the guests. We fuck the guests. We want you to think you're rolling on a drug. I you think you're having an acid stay. flashback in that chair. Like- she, this poor girl's rolling down a hill trying to hold the table to stay up. Ben, this, she does real podcast, please. She does real shit. I bet Dr. Drew didn't have a mechanical chair. He would if there was money in it. I like how he asked. <laughs> oh, you didn't request. Yeah. Yeah. You want a stable chair? Oh, you want real furniture? Well, speak up. Speak up. Did you want to be stationary? Yeah, we start you off in a beanbag chair. And then depending on how well you do, we get you... I had some, I was in uh, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina for good nights. And everyone's like, oh, Raleigh's such a charming town, you know? And <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine, you know? Uh, I'm a little over college towns. I'm yeah. a little over having like three universities in a town. And that's all they're known for is college kids. Every, every coffee shop. And restaurant and bar is just teeming with college kids. And all of the adults act like children because they want to be cool too. And they feel like they found the fountain of youth because they're in a college town. I'm over that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how you feel about college towns. I don't like them. Yeah. I just, I don't know. But see, here's the one thing that saved Raleigh for me. Here's what saved Raleigh for Timmy. 
there was a big maximum security prison right in the middle of town. In the middle of three colleges? Yes, which is why my, my late show Saturday was a little light because many of my fans were in prison. They couldn't get out. So I immediately lock eyes with this prison that's been operational since 1884. They've only got 1,100 people in there. They're all serving more than 20 years. Oh, my God. Maximum security. They have a wing for safekeepers, which means if, you're, if, you're, if you've tried to escape, if you're too violent or too vulnerable, you need extra attention from the jail. They put you in a wing called safekeepers, right? So I'm reading all about the central Ohio jail or central prison, whatever they call it. Uh, not Ohio, North Carolina. <laughs> Who gives a shit, really? <laughs> and so I, we're, we're having horrific pizza with the manager of the club. Great woman, Brandy. And uh, me and the feature and the uh, host were having like shitty pizza. Uh, and I, you know, I, we, we leave and we were walking back to the hotel and then we see the jail and I go, let's take a closer look. And so we walk right up to the uh, train tracks. And then on the other side is the barbed wire and the, what's the big tower called where the guy stands in it, the watch, watch tower, tower. whatever it is, uh, the guard tower. I don't and so the feature goes, do you think we can get a tour of the jail? And I'm like, well, that is the whitest thing you've said. <laughs> uh, no, no, we can't. And also, what a bad look. <laughs> but that'll happen soon. Once they start letting people out of jail, because once they legalize weed, they, they can't keep everybody in jail. So once they still, they will repurpose these prisons as resorts and a bunch of white bitches will be in San Quentin. They will be taking <laughs> photos on the electric chair being like, look who's been a naughty girl. Like, it'll be, and there'll still be people in the jail. There'll still be several wings operational in the jail. And then these bitches will go in and they'll be like, I've always wanted to see Rikers bachelor party at Rikers. And it'll be, they'll have theme. I'm telling you, if you think it's not going to happen, it's going to happen. They'll have theme trips. I'm, I'm predicting this here. And somebody else may have predicted it. And somebody, no. and it may be, it may be <laughs> happening already. I'm telling you, it may be happening already. People will spend money to stay in jails. They will spend money to go on some weird vacation in a jail. So I said, I said, we can't take a tour, but I said, you want to get into jail? I'll get you into jail. <laughs> I get you into jail. Not a problem. Get you into jail. You want to go into jail? Let's go into jail. So the next day, it's visitor's day. Maximum security jail. I said, pull right up, ignore getting the pass, pull into the lot where all the COs are, pull in. We pull into the lot. We start seeing the parents come out and they're parents. You know, maybe they're brothers and sisters, maybe they're uh, wives, husbands, significant others. But you see some parents walk out. It is very powerful and wild to watch parents walk out of a maximum security prison. Wow. It's really wild. Okay. And I didn't even know it was visitor's day. We were just going to, I'll tell you what we did in a minute, but we're watching all these parents come out of the jail and they have that, that like resigned look of like, well, this is what life is now. And you think it's so amazing. They love somebody who's done like a horrible thing and they're, and they're all kind of saying hello to each other. They kind of know each other. They're in this weird community of people that can only relate to each other. Right. Yeah. And it's very strong. The bond that people probably have in those situations because they're like, you know, they probably can't talk about it in like polite society, their son or daughter or whoever. I think it's all male. I think it's all male jail. But, you know, it has done some horrible shit. And uh, so we're watching them walk out. And then we watched the last of them walk out. And I said to the feature, I said, you ready? He goes, Yeah. He goes, you got a plan? I said, I got a plan. So we're walking up to a maximum security prison in Raleigh, North Carolina, without any pass, without anything. We have no reason to be there. I walk, we walk up, and my heart is fluttering. His heart is fluttering. I don't know exactly what I'm going to say. I like this podcast. I kind of like doing it on the fly. Yeah. And the doors are blacked out. And if there's guards and everything... She opened the doors and there's a CO there, big, big black chick sitting there looking at me. And I said, how are you? She goes, close the door behind you. I said, right. 
So I closed the door behind you. I walked up to her. I said, how are you, dear? She goes, good. She's like taken back. I go, we're comedians. We're doing the comedy club. You know the comedy club? She's like, I do not. I said, fair enough. <laughs> I said, we would like to do a show for the inmates. We do it in New York a lot. We like to. We like to uh, so is there anybody that we could talk to? And she's like, well, you'd have to speak to the chaplain, but he's not until Monday. So we got as far as, and that was it. And then my friend's like, can I use the bathroom? She goes, you got to use it in that other building. So w- w- that was as far as we got. Now, had the chaplain been there, we might have been able to get in and talk to the chaplain. I was thinking, what if, what if they let us do it? What if she was like, now, obviously, it would, it would take planning and approval and all that shit. Right. But wouldn't it be hilarious if she's like, oh, you want to do a show? Let's go. She gets on the mic. She's like, we got a couple of clowns in here. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, you think you're funny? Let's go. You know? Uh, and then you, you just, guys pitch that to NBC. So that was as far as we got into the prison. Yeah, we should pitch that to NBC. <laughs> they, they, they would buy it and have somebody else do it. Um, that's as far as we got into the prison. But prisons are interesting. You've never been in prison. No, but I've hung out with their uh, that type. Yeah. Quite a bit. So that that maximum security wing of the maximum security would be rats too, right? Uh, Well, people that are vulnerable. So I guess it's people that are- Rats and chomos. Yeah. Yeah. People that have sang. Mm -hmm. I was looking at this prison and I'm like, of all the places you can go in the world, like you're in this cell, maybe 23 hours a day. I don't know, but I know some of them, they are. And- it's really amazing to me that sometimes this could be somebody just making a mistake when they're young. Bad, bad mistake, wrong place, wrong time. Falsely accused. Innocent people that were falsely accused that didn't have the right. And they have to spend their entire life in this. Or even if you did the thing, you have to spend at least 20 years. And for most of them, I think over 50% of them are serving life. I would kill myself for sure. Would it, you? I, you know, I would, but I think I'd be very popular there. I think I'd be very <laughs> well liked. I think I'd be so well liked <laughs> that it would be hard to. Kathy Griffin's husband, who robbed her, by the way, and good for him. <laughs> she met none of his emotional needs, you know, and she was stalking her agent all the time. Didn't give a fuck what he was doing, but he fleeced her. He took all her money. She said the one indication. <laughs> that he was totally fucked up is when she said, what if you go to jail, Matt? And he went, you know, I thought about that and I think I'd be okay in there. And she said, when he came to her and basically said, I thought I'd do well in jail, like that would be okay with me. She knew how far gone he was. And so to me, I would have a very hard time in that type of situation. But it's a, there are people that spend their entire life in that being confined and living in that, that's a world unto itself. There are people who were addicted to that. And I would watch them like get them. They would get out and the self-sabotage was so over the top to get themselves put back in because they didn't know how to function. They liked it better knowing where they were going to like, they weren't capable of creating that structure for themselves. So they would just get themselves put back into jail but I I cannot handle being told what to do. I go way out of my way to prevent ever being told what to do. So I couldn't, I could live in a, I would do well. I would probably do well. I figure people out pretty easy. I'm pretty good at. So that's interesting because I've heard that before that there's people that just get out and they, especially if you're, let's say you get in at 18 and you get out in your thirties or forties. Yeah. They're institutionalized. Yeah. You're institutionalized. You have no skills. What are you going to do? And the recidivism rate is very high. People just go back and they want to go back. Yeah. Well, and like in Portland, where I hung out with these types of people, it was very different. Portland, where everyone should be in jail. Yeah, there's a bit. The Portland uh, law enforcement, what do you call it? The justice system in Portland is famous in other states. It's crazy. Portland is like Oregon itself is just a police state. When you, I drive up from California, I feel watched. 
as soon as I get on the roads. It's like the I-5 is 65 fucking miles an hour and there's cops everywhere, Portland's cameras everywhere. Why do you think that is? Uh, Because it feels like the opposite when we watch. They present it that way, yeah. Right, we we see the clashes all the time between like Antifa and the Proud Boys and you see these like fights that happen in downtown Portland. It seems like it's fucking like just utter chaos. Yeah. Um, but you're saying there are there is actually kind of there are police there and they are watching like Yeah, what it's a are heavy doing. Yeah, I've lived in other states, California, I don't know where the cops are. Uh I never yeah. see them. <laughs> they are uh Delaware was really easy as far as cops. I don't think I ever got pulled over or anything the entire time I lived there. Right. But Portland, the cops are everywhere. When you were living there, was that brand of anarchy that you see now something that was around or obvious? Or I know that a lot of it has been, you know, I think uh, the catalyst for these clashes has been Trump and it's been the rise of, you know, people on the far right was that something that you were around? Were people very politically engaged uh, to a point where they were, were there a lot of demonstrations or was that something that Portland was like the, the hippie movement was just kind of growing there. It was like when, when Portland was normal, when I was a kid, when I was growing up, Portland was just normal and kind of dumpy. And then the whole time I was doing meth, the biggest issue in Portland was drugs and crime and tweakers. Tweakers were everywhere fucking everyone shit up. And so that was the big issue that the cops were necessary for. There was always kind of that granola edge to Portland, but it wasn't super political because we... X generation just wasn't political. Right. Right. They just weren't polit- You couldn't get anybody to give a shit after 9-11. There was yeah. barely anything. Right. So then the millennials start to you know, come of age and that's where the political movement. Yeah. I think started again. Cause I don't remember anything like that. What do you, one of the things that if people don't know anything about you, uh, one of the things I've always found fascinating about you is you're a spiritual person, but you're also very funny and <laughs> you are, you're very funny and you, you have actual life experience. You're not, you know, a lot of spiritual people are, you know, wealthy like i have i have a thing where i say white chicks over 40 in la where they stop being hot they're like it's about spirituality yeah. <laughs> now because no one's looking at them and buying them drinks all the time you come at spirituality from a place of like being a meth head yeah uh, you know being hanging out with tweakers you know the true path yeah the true path right but i feel like it is to be honest with you i agree with you you get to this place where you're having these experiences uh, that people talk about, usually on psychedelics, you're getting there with meth. Yeah, it's so exciting to see people, it becoming so normal for people to be doing psychedelics and having these experiences. Because when it happened to me in 2000, there was nobody. I never found anyone else like me. And the stuff that I found when I died And was told when I died, the only other place I could find it on the internet was like real crazy people that talking to the Galactic Federation and shit. And so I love that it's normalized now. Everyone's doing DMT. I never even heard of fucking DMT. People are like doing ayahuasca and like Burbank. There's like ayahuasca tours at the Grove, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's mainstream to a point where it's like, wait a minute. Somebody the other day was like, what do you do? They're like, I'm a shaman. I'm like, oh, fuck you. (laughs) Not a shaman. You're not a shaman. It's like you go on commercial <laughs> acting auditions. You're a shaman. You know? But it, it, it is where pe- people are trying to expand their mind. Yeah, we got to. Yeah. So give us a little primer here. And if you're listening to this, now's the time to spark up the joint. Or worse. <laughs> I don't judge. Um, you talk a lot about... This new consciousness. Yeah. 5D. 5D. Well, I'm going to give my disclaimer first. If this sounds like bullshit, then it's not for you and it's fine. You don't have to let me know that you think it's bullshit. Uh, I did a lot of drugs. This could just be the result of uh, meth-induced schizophrenia or I could have a brain tumor. So That should be the disclaimer of every comics act. (laughs) Every comic should get on stage and go, by the way, I've done a lot of drugs. This could be bullshit. You don't have to let me know it's bullshit. Quietly leave. Um, 
Um, all right. <clears throat> 2000, I die. I go into, uh, I end up in a big blue ball of light. Big blue. How do you die? Let me just ask how you die. <laughs> I mean, either GHB or there were Russians that were poisoning me. Fair enough. Yeah, Ukrainians. Sorry. It's Eastern always Europeans. fucking Russia. I it never get to tell that. To Ru- yeah. I never get to tell that story because it's never on Patreon. But um, yeah, so. Well, well, why are the Russians poisoning you? you I over that. was. Uh, boyfriend or I was girlfriend of one of them and then the other one I thought loved me and I was doing a lot of like paper shuffling stuff which was just me being a tweaker and a clingy girlfriend to his brother but he thought I was trying to do something far more nefarious and so he was just putting arsenic eastern Europeans don't give a fuck like they don't give a shit about human life. And I was just some tweaker girlfriend of his brother. Hundreds so. and hundreds of years of forced atheism. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I've had Russians when I was a tour guide in New York city on a tour bus, Russians would get on my bus. They have beautiful blue baby blue husky eyes and nothing behind them. No souls forced atheism. What does that mean? Well, under communism, okay. they destroyed all, all the, you know, there was no religion. So these people believed in nothing for a very, very long time. And that's, I think, how you get that very hard. And the winter doesn't help. Yeah. But I think that's part of why you get that very hard, pragmatic. Like, Russians are, are kind of realistic. They don't believe the government. In America, people believe the government. Go, the FBI is investigating the Epstein. I yeah. will get to the bottom of it. <laughs> Russia, you can't. They know. They know it's all fake. Yeah. If you talk to Russians, it's kind of. It's actually kind of refreshing. It is very, yeah. Because they're like, yeah, no, they're lying to us. That's what they're there to do is lie. Um, so these guys were cold. Yeah, he was just putting arsenic in my Mountain Dew for... And you know that. He t- he ends up telling me later. Wow. So I've never told a story on anything before. So he was putting arsenic in my Mountain Dew for, I don't know, six months or something. What a white trash way to die. And then I die. (laughs) And when I wake up in the hospital after the near death experience, he is there to pick me up. And then he takes me and drops me off at the house that I used to live with him and his brother. But his brother and I had had broken up by then. And the only thing in the house is this Kool-Aid and this bread. And I'm just in the middle of this near death experience where I'm like talking to aliens and stuff, which just could be the result of my brain getting eaten by arsenic. And I drink this Kool-Aid and eat this bread and days go by. And at the end of the week, he shows up with a gun in a cigar box. And I used to call this guy Balky because he spoke super, super, which you won't get. You might get. I Balky. love Perfect Strangers. Yeah. Balky um, and Larry. That's how he talked. Oh. There's no way he's getting that. He doesn't. Um, he's a great sitcom. Uh, great. One of the best. He talked just like Balky. So I could never understand anything that he was saying. So the part I could understand was he was like, uh, they tell you to go, the body will just be twitching. And then I don't do accents. The body will just be twitching. And then you just shoot the body. But then you get there and the body's like, blah, 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 which I totally was because I was like, I met God and it's a vibrating ball of light, you know? Anyway, so somehow the arsenic just leveled me up even higher into this or something. I don't know. I was high on the arsenic because the Kool-Aid and the bread was just more arsenic. So, like, we lose contact after a little while. I actually attempt suicide at his house a few months after this and then also don't die again. And then I don't see him for a year or two. And then he tracks me down to tell me that the people from the Ukrainian church believe me to be a witch because I wouldn't die. And then he basically confesses to trying to kill me and tells me all of this stuff. And I was like, okay, wait. And like made him retrace his steps because I couldn't understand anything he said. But anyway, now he's like my Facebook friend and it's awkward. So... I don't ever get to tell the story. <laughs> they try to give me to it for uh, some storytelling thing. And I'm like, I had this guy's like on my social media. He doesn't follow me on Twitter. So I guess I'll tell the it man who day. tried to kill you with arsenic. Cause I get it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I did a lot of really shady stuff to his brother. I pulled a little bit of a nine 11 on his brother. Cause then I, remember when I got paranoid about 9-11 and was like, what do you do if you want to take someone's freedom away? You create a false adversary and then pretend to protect them from it. So what did you do And he brother? was like, yeah, what you did to my brother was fucked up. And I was like, oh, okay. What did you do I to his brother? I created a false adversary and pretended. What? Like what? 
Oh, I'd robbed some guy or I sent my personal assistant to go rob. <laughs> you had a personal assistant? Yes. <laughs> you did. You were doing better on math than anyone I know is doing completely lucid. It's great. Um, I sent my personal assistant, which is just a kid I gave some math to, to do. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think it came from a headhunter. I didn't think an agency staffed him. I was pretty sure you were losing that, you, using that term loosely. I sent him to rob somebody or something and he got beat within an inch of his life. Oh. And then I told my boyfriend, like, uh, we were protecting you. These guys wanted to come after you and not like they caught us in their window or whatever. Right. And so um, then I just had like a lot of like paperwork because my family, my stepdad's family had like a tax accounting office and I would just shuffle paper, like tweakers have like a tweak, right? And mine was always papers. And so I may have like tried to get his brother to sign over power of attorney to me, but it was definitely just, just for fun. It was just like, so he couldn't break up with me. Interesting. So he couldn't fuck that bitch Shannon with the big tits, but it was like total, like I understand. I get where the wires got across. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a mature person that can say, Hey, you tried to murder me, but I get it. You know? Yeah. So <laughs> you go to that big blue ball of light. Yeah. This is gonna, I feel like my credibility shot. No, it's enhanced. I actually think it's enhanced. It's enhanced at this point. All right. I go to the big blue ball of light. The big blue ball of light says, you learned what you came to learn. You did everything you came to do, went to do, whatever. You can stay here now if you want, or you can go back. If you want to go back, we have a cool job for you to do. And... Uh, the gist, the very cliff notes, cause you can find the story fucking everywhere is that they said reality is basically a video game essentially. Cause there's no, you know, the best metaphor to describe it. It's a game. Earth is a stage. We've been playing on this stage for a grip. We come here. We sometimes remember that we are God. Sometimes we don't remember. It's just all these different games, but we're currently playing a 3D fear-based reality game where uh, everything's split in half. It's all dichotomy-based, so good, bad, right, wrong, light, dark, male, female. And that all of that is ceasing to exist. Uh, a group of beings are coming to the planet. They're going to wipe that, all of the parameters away. And then uh, we will go back into one consciousness. We'll all get to play in a higher dimensional game, eight dimensions, and then I get fired, I guess. And we will be able to levitate, move things with our eyes. Male and female will cease to exist. Good and bad will cease to exist. No capitalism, no religion, no death, no disease. Well, we're halfway there. Yeah. <laughs> we're on our way. So uh, they taught me a bunch of shit. I spent four years in what was we've got named Alien School on your podcast. Yeah. Uh, thanks. You've named all my shit. You I named name my podcast, it, yeah. and you named this. Well, we own it. You know, yeah. uh, me and <laughs> me and those Eastern Europeans own it. You don't know that, but guess who we signed power of attorney over to. Spoiler alert. Uh, um, so you you find out all this shit, which is very very interesting, and you basically begin to you be, you start to realize you're you're perceptive. Yeah. You start to realize that you're perceptive and that you have some level of psychic ability, some level of you're able to uh, infer things or you're able to, uh, how would you explain it? So that was actually a gift that I knew I had younger in life. And I did a five-year stint in Christianity and I met a prophetess who told me that I would have the gift of discernment in the end times and I would be able to cut through the crap and I would be able to see when everyone else was deceived, I would be able to see what was really happening and I would be used. She told me all this shit years and years before. And then that gift kind of activated and I was doing like a girl's prison ministry and suddenly I could just see into all of their lives and see their trauma and see what they needed to heal in order to get better. And so I started like speaking, like telling them, the stuff, but like a normal human being, not like a weird fucking prophetess in a flowing gown. I was just like, oh, yeah, you have to like connect these dots. And then I got caught doing that. And they called me into the office at the church and they were like, 
Yeah, I mean, we don't really get into that very super spiritual stuff, but also like your husband's not involved enough. And so as a woman, you can't be uncovered like that. So and just kind of like made me put it away. And so comes back with the aliens. You're one of the only people I know. You've been married to both a Christian minister and a Satanist. Yes. <laughs> You've been married to both a Christian minister and a Satanist. Yes. <laughs> Wild. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't like to go around the same lap right. too many times. Was there a similarity between them? No, there's a similarity between everyone I've ever been passionately in love with. They're all right. in, indoctrinated uh, pastors, kids, something like that. And then the Satanist was like a different kind of love. Right. That's why it lasted for so long. Yeah. The Satanist was the, <laughs> probably the better, the more, you know, attached to reality uh, than <laughs> the other people. What would you say, your, your perceptive, we have a lot of talks about like energy. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that you, you really understand, I think, better than most people is that Trump seems to be a life force for his opponents as well as his supporters. Like the people that really love him, uh, he, they derive a certain sense of um, identity or purpose from his ascent to the presidency. But in the same way, the people that hate him also seem to derive the very same things from their opposition to him. And when you go, you know, we'll, we'll go on Twitter, you see all these people that hate Trump and all they do all day is tweet about him, talk about him, tweet at him, quote him. Um, as somebody who's more perceptive than most, what would you say that is? Because I think you're, you were kind of keyed into that. And you were saying that, because everybody supposedly wants a new reality, right? Right. Trump's the current reality. People want another reality. But they've actually invested themselves very heavily in this reality. They're making a lot of money in this reality. They have shows about him, cartoons about him, podcasts about him. So what is it? What are they not realizing? When they've made this guy, uh, or, or, or if not made him, sustained him as the you know i watched the news in north carolina and i watched pbs the public television and they were they had bbc news bbc news had one story about trump you know it was the g8 or the g20 whatever it is g20 oh, and and uh everything else was about other things that were happening around the world boris johnson uh things in you know other countries i had no idea what was even going on um it was not simply just the fixation on trump what are these people that want a new reality? What are they missing? Um, that they are creating the reality that they are living in. And now it's kind of more of a timeline thing because we actually are in a higher dimensional reality than we used to be. So what we explain used to, that. So uh, when I say dimensions, that's separate than timelines. And these are just my words to describe things. But timelines are there's an infinite number of variables. There's an infinite number of possible timelines that you could be on. And there's no value judgment to what they are. You could be on the very best timeline. The only thing keeping you off of the very best timeline is your belief in either the timeline that you're on or your belief in whether or not you're worthy of getting to another timeline. Can we use the word reality and timeline interchangeably? Yes. Okay. Be, yeah. Okay. And dimensions are just kind of like Photoshop layers almost of extra abilities and extra things that you can perceive. So like 4D came and on And these abilities board. could be things like empathy. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So they could be... Because another thing I like about you is like a lot of this sounds very all over the it is it's very like high level, high minded stuff. And some of it is. Yeah. But I think also you you relate it to people by saying these could just be skills that you lack. You don't know yourself. You don't know your environment. And the better you uh, when you attain these skills like empathy 
or knowledge or whatever, that's when you can manifest another reality. A ton of them you have. You've right. just been possibly intentionally taught your entire life that you don't have them. So in 2012, because we are one collective consciousness, we are one collective consciousness that breaks up into a million different pieces so that we can experience a bunch of things, but it's all an illusion. You and I being two separate consciousnesses, I don't, I can never get that right, is an illusion, but we've been living separate for so many thousands of years that now our consciousness is trying to come back together. And there are barriers to that. There's programming that is a barrier to that, but it's happening. And that's what like telepathy is, is just kind of waking up to that ability that we are connected. So in 2012, at the end of the Mayan calendar, which was technically the end of that 3D thing, we did like log on to the same uh, network mentally. So in the mental space, we all started to reconnect to each other. Now, how did that manifest? Because nobody knows that it manifested as mass social anxiety manifested as everybody started to turn into an introvert. Suddenly they didn't like to be in crowds anymore. Everybody just started to turn within because when you're standing there talking to someone, you're actually interacting with them. Tell it not telepathically. I would uh, when I say telepathy, it's usually you have kind of honed that skill a little bit. But an example that I use of 4D is somebody is telling you why they need to buy a car or break up with their girlfriend, and you can just tell that they're kidding themselves. You can tell that they're self deceiving. You can tell that they're lying. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You just feel that they're lying. That feels like something we've always been able to do, but it's not something. There are some people who've had that gift their whole life, but for the most part, anybody knows how to do that now. And that is because you were connected to that person. You were connected to that person in the place where we really are. What role does technology play in this? Because Huge. around the end of the Mayan calendar, you started to see a lot of new platforms that united people as well. I think the internet in general has been a great allegory for this process as we were slowly coming together. Because the merging of consciousness and the um, access, because as we merge uh, together, um, we have access to all information and experience from other people's lives, which is really what empathy is. Empathy is the sensation that you've been there before. So empathy is like a superpower is if you're talking to someone who's just getting clean. And they're, they're in that like first week or whatever, or they're in this like frustrated one month in, you can empathize with them and help them because you've been there before. And the gift of empathy is you kind of have that sensation about things you haven't even experienced. Like you can just kind of intuitively help someone through grief, even if you've never experienced grief. Like that's what empathy is. And that comes from being connected to everybody. So you have access to everybody's experiences. We've just never been taught any of this shit. So it all just manifests as anxiety, depression, uh, feeling overwhelmed, feeling hopeless. It's because you're just tapped into everybody and you, nobody taught you how to firewall anything off. Nobody taught you how to control it. Nobody taught you where the control panels are. So everyone's just going nuts and it's because you're plugged in. Why is there such a resistance to spirituality on this level? Uh, I mean, it's not new. The stuff that you say about, you know, one consciousness experiencing each other subjectively. It's like Bill Hicks talked about it and Terrence McKenna. And then and then and then I'm just talking about like the the recent examples in my world of, of you know, comedy and everything. But I mean, you go back to, you know, uh, uh, Buddhism and things like that. Eastern religions seem to talk about this. Am I wrong on that? No. Yeah. So what is it about the Western world? Uh, or, or not even only Western, but Judaism, Judeo-Christian, or Islam, the major big three religions that kind of don't go anywhere near the spirituality. Like the major three religions in the world don't really go anywhere near this stuff. Uh, but when you, when you go back to Eastern religions, a lot of them do, or ancient religions, a lot of them do. So for... When I was going to alien school, they took me back through what was called the dispersion project. And this was when we were trying to split up into as many conscious. I, I'm going to fuck that word up all night into many uh, selves what was it as called? possible. The dispersion project it was on true TV. And <laughs> <laughs> I 
you remember. Uh, <laughs> it only lasted one season. And so this was when it was like, be fruitful and multiply, spread out, try to get as many bodies on the planet as possible so we are broken up into as many pieces as possible. And throughout history, because we were supposed to be asleep, there had to be a certain amount of people that were awake on the planet at once to kind of pass this information down. So this is what all this like ancient knowledge and some of these religions were. And a lot of Christianity is exactly this. Like revelations is what's happening right now. And Jesus was just awake. He was just awake. That's why he could do stuff is because none of the rules applied to him. But when you give that information to people who are asleep, who are dead asleep and have no chance of fucking waking up, they just turn it into like, uh, Men in Black, where they had those little tiny cute aliens in the locker that turned a whole religion into that business card because they don't fucking, they don't get it. So they're just like, okay, no gay people. Right. And it's like, that's that's all they can take away from it is because they just add their own bullshit to right. it. They turn it into rules because that's what they're made of. So there was a huge resistance to it because it wasn't time yet. And now it's time for everybody to wake the fuck up. And so people are coming in from all different directions. Um, a lot of like, I don't like the new age movement. They're very off putting to me. I don't, I'm very judgy of those group of people. If you do yoga and it's part of your personality, I assume you're a piece of shit. You have to like prove that you're not right. a piece of shit to me. Well, I have a yoga class. So I do your yeah. research <laughs> before you walk into a podcast. <laughs> Not everybody that's been awake has been good, right? There are some people that have used maybe they're or maybe they're not awake, but we, you know, people talk all the time about we kid around. We use this word reptilians. Yeah. We say that the people that are at the apex of society have a vested interest in keeping people asleep. Yeah. They've been running the show. I mean, we're going to have Whitney Webb back on who wrote this amazing. She's one of the only people doing actual journalism about. Not only the Epstein suicide, whatever, but the nexus of people that have been subverting democracy forever, for a very long time. And the, and the, and the people that have been able to put, um, you know, uh, uh, people that have been able to uh, put a lot of pressure on the levers of power. And some of them are in the government. And some of them are, are are private people. You'll have no idea who the fuck they are. But you've always talked about, and we've always talked about, how the, the power that they derive is from people basically handing over their power to them. Yeah, so the, the elite, the powers that be, are what I call either vampires right now, because va there's many vampires, I'll get into that, or parasites. But they are parasites really they are not gods they are not the split up ball of light they are either something that is native to earth i don't know earth is one of us also so i the um i don't get into this conspiracy theory shit right. but i was into reptilian agenda stuff back before it was cool and i asked the aliens about it and they were like reptilians kind of a weird way to put it they are parasites they're not gods the only way that they can create reality is to trick gods which is us into creating that reality for them that's it like they can get you to create the reality by getting you to complain about them because then you were just reinforcing when you a god says the rich just keep getting richer. That's reality has to do what you say. It doesn't, it can't do like, they don't have that ability. They are not creators. So they are awake in the sense that they know that you're God and you don't know that you're God, but they are not capable of going up into the higher dimensions. They really, they can't go past three. Why are so many of them pedophiles? They feed off of energy in a very standard, I guess this is worth uh, getting into right now because the vampire thing is big. So we went from four to five. Now five is where we all connect at the, at the inner, um, emotional body. So now we are all beginning to connect to each other in the emotional realm. And the emotional realm is the spiritual, like energetic realm. So now we are starting to get to a place where I tell people, go to the mall and look at, look at couples. 
and pay attention and see, are you able to tell if that couple's holding hands? Are you able to tell that they're holding hands because they're happy to be here right now? Or can you pick up on the fact that they were fighting earlier and that they're holding hands because he's trying to make it up to her and blah, blah, blah. Because you should be able to tune into that now because you're now tuned into people's energy exchanges. Once we get to this level, you cannot lie. You cannot lie once people have this level of perception. People then start to tune in to the energy exchanges around them. So I'm getting a lot of people, I do readings, I'm getting a lot of people who are having to get rid of their mom because their mom's a narcissist. They're having to uh, find ways to navigate around having to deal with their ex-husband, you know, child's father, because now the, the vampires who have been feeding off of you your whole life, you can feel that. And now people are starting to tune into the fact that the parasites, vampires, same thing, people that are using your energy to fuel their reality are using you for that. And how they mostly use people is triggering the fuck out of them. So um, the people that hate Trump are giving Trump more energy than the people who love Trump. Right. And really, the people who love Trump, for the most part, don't love Trump they just feel, they just hate the people who hate Trump. Right. Does that make sense, right. right? Yeah, it does. And in a classic narcissist, have you ever dealt with a real, like a real narcissist, like NPD? I have a mirror. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a real narcissist has a, a few different tools in their toolbox to stir you up so that you'll feed them energy. And they kind of rotate those tools. But one of them is to pick an absurd fight with you because in the absurd fight, you will just, I use the word squirt energy because it's, it's like how right. forceful it goes out, but it's gross. Um, you will give them energy because you're like, this is ridiculous. I would never have, did this, you know? And so that's what like Trump does is he just keeps triggering the fuck out of people over and over and over and over again. And this is just, everyone's just giving him energy from a reality transurfing stand, um, uh, perspective. Reality transurfing is learning how to hop from timeline to timeline. There are certain things that will pull you in and, uh, what they call pendulums is one of them, but pendulums can only swing if you're pushing the other direction. If Trump had a bunch of fans and then everyone else ignored him, which I know is fucking impossible uh, that this is never going to happen. But if everyone just unplugged from that and stopped giving it so much power and took all of that energy and that need to help fix something and focused it on picking a fucking candidate that everybody could agree on. Right. You know, and I don't, I don't like to get into the government shit because who gives a shit, but, or solving a problem rather than complaining about the problem. Right. And I'm not, a lot of people have made a lot of change, so I'm not criticizing that and everything has its place, but from a creating reality standpoint, you wouldn't ever acknowledge the thing you don't want unless you want to take it with you. Right. So uh, I do like the two cut method sometimes for jumping dimensions where you put the thing you have, the timeline you're on, on one cup, and then you put the timeline you want to be on on the other cup, and then you, whatever, Google two cup manifestation method. But it's just a dumb ritual to kind of like help your brain uh, change places. But you would never mention the thing you don't want. So you wouldn't put in debt and then out of debt. You would right. put in debt and financially free. If you wanted to... If we wanted to collectively jump to a timeline where this fucking idiot is gone, like we wouldn't empower him in the new timeline. Right. You wouldn't have like one cup be like, no Trump. Right. Or, or like, uh, like one, one cup would be like, President Trump, bad. Yeah. And the next cop would be like, President Trump, bad. Ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is what it feels like now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's very important. And I think that's interesting. And you say that the pedophile stuff is them feeding on the energy of young, innocent. Yeah. So fear is when people give up the most energy. So sick. Um, but this is real shit. Sex, rape. Occultism. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of occult shit going on at the higher levels of the government. Yeah, and it gets a lot of like, oh, Satanism and stuff like that. It's just, no, right. these are just it's any, not humans. It's any is. That's why right. they age different. Anybody ever notice that? They age yeah. different and they're like, oh, it's the stress. Oh, are they stressed? 
Are they? Are they? Well, it was like I when I saw George H. W. Bush's funeral, there were literal demons crawling up to the podium to eulogize him. Like literal, these guys were in their eighties, and they would they'd be like, "I knew George a long time ago," and I'm like, "Does no one else see?" Yeah, that these are literal demons, like literal. Their features the, get very sharp. Yes. When they age rather than saggy like everyone else. Yes. Is they get very sharp. Yeah. They become such obvious. I think that's probably why they call them reptilians is because they start to look very reptile. Like, I don't remember. Dan Brokaw, I think, got. Was it him? Who's no. that? No, no, no. Um, Tom Brokaw? Tom Brokaw. <laughs> okay. Dan's his loser brother. <laughs> I think it's Tom Brokaw. I don't remember. There was one of the newscasters after 9-11 just turned into a reptilian overnight. It was very strange. So for people that are listening to this and they're like, a lot of it seems great, but how do I apply it? Like, okay. how do I, because everyone else is nuts and, and, and Twitter's bad and all these things are bad and you have to leave your house and come into contact with all these people and how can you individually hop to another reality if everybody around you is so fucking insane get to 5d and you get to 5d 5d is encrypted in your trauma this is so nobody else can come except for the people willing to do the work so here are the things stopping you from getting to 5d you probably Where already is have logan at because you say he's yeah. very awake I don't know if he know. like there are tons of people that are just uh, like going into higher dimensions, but he and might not, not know, but he's up there. Yeah. 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 He, yeah. he like lives his life according to higher dimensional reality. That's why he's so successful. Right. Um, programming that will hold you back. Shame, guilt, uh, limiting beliefs, fear of loss. Right now it's, it's really like love and attachment stuff. Uh, trust issues, intimacy issues, codependency, anything that makes it difficult for you to connect with another person because we all have to connect to each other. Once this 5D update is like completely downloaded, then I would be able to access your talents. I would just be right. able to use them as my own. Well, I don't like this. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so obviously... If I have issues with codependency and I have trouble respecting people's boundaries and not encroaching on their space or whatever, and you have trust issues, we're not going to connect well and be able to share like so that. Everybody's so got to get over their shit. You got to work through your shit, but it's in a completely different way than we had to work through our shit to get to 4D. So 4D required us to, and without anybody really knowing it, kind of healing in the mental space. And healing in the mental space was like, I see where this actually worked out in my best interest, so I'll forgive this person or right. you know, I'll move on with this. And so a lot of people can't feel their feelings because shit got splintered off when they were a kid. They have their inner child hidden somewhere and so you have to kind of go back and feel feel all that pain kind of find your is inner this child. level of perception evidence in the fact that like if you watch cable television you're now you're like how did i ever watch this yes how how did these commercials ever get anyone to buy anything yes why are the best shows that i try to rewatch other than a few of them why do I watch them and I go, oh my God, this, why, how did I ever like this? Because it's fake. You can't tolerate right. anything that's fake. Right. So we used to sit through shows that had fucking laugh tracks. Right. You can't take anything that's fake. So you and I walked around, because I talk about this on my podcast all the time. Yeah. You and I walked around a neighborhood one night. Hancock Park. And you were like, these people's needs are all met. And they all yes. know exactly who they are. Yes. And then a couple right. blocks later, you were like, these people have their financial needs met, but they feel like they have to prove who they are. Right. And the neighborhoods didn't necessarily look different, but you could right. feel the energy of these people who were in well, their I house. Well, I know the, the sizes of yeah. the plots, and they were a little different. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you're not seeing the backyard. <laughs> They're quite different, actually. <laughs> quite different. Uh, but no, I, uh, yeah, well, the thing about rich people, we're not talking about the demon rich that are, you know, fucking kids on an island, <laughs> but people that just have their needs met, right? People that have their needs met um, have a different energy. Yeah. They have a different energy than people that are, and I'm going to talk, I'm doing next week, I'm doing an episode about how to be popular in high school. <laughs> which is the most Timely. important it's the most important thing on earth and 
people that don't agree with that, I understand or whatever. Um, but it's not only high school, but popularity. But we've demonized popularity. We think it's wrong or bad or people liking you is not good. And it's the nerds that are the brilliant ones, the ones that are alone all the time. Those are the really valuable people. And then all the nerds write pop culture. So they invent these stories where the nerds always get the girl and the nerds are the ones that succeed in life. But the popular kids all end up being, you know, garbage men, which is a great job now, by the way. <laughs> Phenomenal job. That's the goal. Um, but... So to me, the secret to popularity, one of them was not caring. Right. Learning how to not care. Yeah. Learning or at least pretending not how to, to care. not be afraid of those people or to not think you are less than those people. Yes. And not caring. And actually, and it's really simple shit that's very, very tough to do. And there's ways to kind of do it. Um, that we'll talk about, but that to me is, and I love how people are going to be like, she's doing all this complex shit and he's talking about high school. <laughs> Shut up. It's the same thing as creating reality though. Yeah, it is. You have to release creating reality. I was like, I want to be nominated importance. for homecoming King. And then I just did it. It was dumb and stupid. Then I realized popularity doesn't really matter. You need money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you graduate and you're like, Oh, this is what? Um, but there's something to me. That a lot of people that are in this are, that are in this they that tread into the waters that you're in are hucksters, or yeah. they are they've enriched themselves selling people junk cures, mm -hmm. and people get kind of fed up with the whole thing. And when I talk to you, I never get that feeling. I get the feeling that you've had this experience. You look at reality in a certain way, and if other people don't, that's okay with you. Yeah. You're not converting people. As no, much. you cannot evangelize higher consciousness. Right. I will sound like the teacher from Charlie Brown unless it's time for you to hear what I'm saying. Right. And I should only be connecting dots or saying things that you've been waiting to hear another person say out loud. I don't want to teach anyone anything. I don't want to be anyone's guru. I actually am doing what I agreed to do in that ball of light, but have been very resistant to it and kind of had to get pushed recently where I, I just didn't want to do it. There's just people like messaging me in a way that made me feel like they thought I was their teacher, their guru or something. And I talk so much shit about that. Anybody who is talking about higher dimensional stuff and giving you any impression other than then you have to find this inside of yourself and that all of the keys to everything are inside of yourself. I can't sell you a painting that's going to raise the vibration. That's a thing. But yeah. like... It's psychedelics are a tool. Yeah, they are a tool. They're absolutely yeah. a tool. But everything you need is inside of yourself. The ability to create your best reality is inside of you. The ability to manifest everything you want. You have your own aliens that you can talk to. You have your own guides. You have your own magic powers. You have it all inside of you. And anybody that creates like a dependent relationship where you have to come to me to get. What about fat people? Because I now I've never been overweight. They can't get. To and I've people. never had a problem with drugs or food. What is the deal with fatties? And I'm asking this. What is it with fats? What is the deal with? Because it's just, they're just fat. Now, what is that? I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious because I'm trying to get on a timeline where I am not fat. Now, you want me to jump to that timeline. Now, in order to jump, I have to not be as fat. <laughs> What is the deal? Because we have an obesity epidemic. We have an opioid yeah. epidemic. We have an epidemic of excess. Mm -hmm. We have an epidemic. What is, is this people not being able to live in this new reality where we're all more interconnected and they can't handle, is it people not able to process their own trauma? Now we're celebrating fat and we're saying it's great to be 800 pounds and it's beautiful. And listen, it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, this is what's happening. Where are you on that? Like, and I'm not saying everybody's got to be a model. Right. But where are you on this movement of people that say, hey, being 600 pounds is great? I have always had mixed feelings on this because yeah. I was fat in the 90s. I was 100 and 100 ish pounds. Wait, a little bit more than 100 pounds overweight in the 90s. Really? When it was like we were only fed airbrushed 
Pam you were, Anderson. Yeah, wh- how fat were you at your fattest? 250. Woo! Twice. Twice a, I've had to lose 100 pounds. Yeah, that Bobby Kelly says. He always says, he points somebody in the audience. He goes, you're on your fourth fat? Yeah. He goes, I can tell. You're on your third fat. Mm-hmm. You're on your fourth fat. That's one of Bobby's yeah. things. You can point to a guy and go, what are you on your fourth fat? Bobby goes, I'm on my fourth fat right now. <laughs> what? So when you were big, you had a lot of food issues. How did you get through that? Do you have photos of yourself when you were big? Yeah. Oh, let's take out the photos. Let's go to the videotape. I cannot picture you fat. I, uh, um, if you were still 250 pounds, you'd be, you'd have three movies right now. <laughs> Isn't that unfortunate? So it's a strange thing. Isn't where- it funny? Everybody got healthy and then Holly was like, we want pigs. <laughs> You're like, what? They're like, no, we were wrong. Put the weight back on. Go back to Sizzler. You're like, I just paid trainers and did all this so I can. I mean, it's very. I am glad I lived long enough for these thighs to come in this style. I'm interested to see what you look like when you were a big pork chop. <laughs> and do you think you were just eating your trauma? I well, I got fat the first time when pregnant with. Okay, here's here's my second fat. Wow. <laughs> But here's the thing. You were a pretty fat chick. Thank you. You were very, listen. Oh, you would have been somebody I would have loved. These were the women that I hung out with. <laughs> These are the women in the bars that I would hang out with. This is exactly the type of woman. <laughs> These are exactly the type of women. There was a big, big woman named Erica. I ate a shrimp out of her mouth. <laughs> in, in, in Lisa's Lounge in Long Island in Baldwin, New York. She was a big, she was a big lady, a big lass. And uh, she was so fun. She had a voice like this. She go, I don't know. I don't know who's working tonight. Why aren't they here? So how did you get? How did you get? Because I am embarking on something where I'm going to need to, for my own health, mentally and physically, I have to stop being the guy that I've been for the last decade. All right. Well, the first. Did time you see the photo mouth. of me that I put up on Instagram today when I was in high school? Yes. Did you see that photo? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Did you masturbate to it? <laughs> You're the producer of this show. You, that photo, I need to get back to where that was because I felt good and I had confidence and, and I was never thin. I was always a little chubby. I always had a little chub. I never had a six pack. I saw these baseball players that went to this Raleigh thing today and they were US baseball or some shit. It was auditions or whatever. And there were all these, maybe they're high school kids or college kids, whatever they were. They were all in shape and yeah. their parents were there and their parents were taking them to this thing that mattered. And I was like, oh, that's what it's supposed to be. Dad. That's <laughs> yeah, what it's I supposed can't to relate be. to that. Either. Yeah. It, 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 parents supporting kids and helping them not, you know, growing up in a bowl of Hidden Valley Ranch <laughs> and fucking going through the, the thing at Wendy's all the time. OK, and this is your first fat. Yeah. OK. You look like a different person here. The first. Yeah. Part. How did you beat it? Meth, but that was (laughs) (laughs) that's it, baby. That's the highlight. There it is. (laughs) The first time was kind of meth, and then the second time I did some crash diet. And uh, wait a minute, what happened to all the spirituality? What happened to the trans surfing and the reality jumping in the timelines? Now you're talking about crash diets and meth, yeah. Well, the spirituality came from the meth. I mean, those two were kind of intertwined. But you, did you eventually get to a point where you were just like, I'm done with being fat? Yeah. Well, so after what I figured out when I did this like HCG diet where you, I'm having a really hard time with words tonight. It's okay. Where you drink pregnant ladies pee. You're not like drinking their pee, but it's a, it's a hormone from pregnant women, whatever. Uh, and you go on a 500 calorie diet. I don't recommend this, but I lost the weight very fast. And at the end of that, at the end of losing like 80 pounds over the course of seven months or something, I set out to figure out what kind of foods my body could actually tolerate. Cause at the core, my issues with weight were that I'm sensitive to or allergic to a lot of foods. Yes. Inflammation. I got to have that test done. I'm going to go see a doctor. Tell me what am I allergic to? I can already tell I had dairy over the weekend. 
and my face broke out yes. and I felt bloated and I didn't feel well. But then you get addicted to it. So when sugar is in your system Why or wheat addic- is in yeah. your system, Why am I addicted? your body's like, give me more because it wants right. more of whatever's in it. First of all, interesting. So any food that's not food is bad. So I don't eat and this can sound hippy dippy or whatever, but my life changed. I was always tired. I could not maintain a weight my whole life. I was either losing or gaining weight. And I don't eat anything with food dye in it. I don't eat anything. Every once in a while, you'll see me eat some chips or something. And then right. um, maybe I'll go to that um, cupcake place and get a, a vegan a, cupcake. A gluten-free cupcake. But usually if I eat sugar, now I can really tell what it does to my body. And then I have to fight the urge to eat more sugar. Because if there's sugar in your system, it's just like sugar. We want more sugar. We need more sugar. We need more sugar. So you've like flushed that out. So my advice to people usually is go hard on green smoothies and cut out sugar, cut out white, like cut out flour. I've never met anybody who tried 30 days without gluten who didn't know that gluten was an issue at the end of it. So that can, I you can make fun that of I'm that if you want. I'm not allergic to gluten, but I should still stop. You should stop for 30 days and then tell me what you think at the end. Right. I don't know what the fuck it is. I don't know if it's the gluten or the shit they spray on the gluten. Yeah, the genetically manipulated wheat. Yeah, well, they're just putting tons of pesticides on it. Like, you can't, you're not going to convince me that that's not a fucking issue. Um, but I've never, every, it gets rid of eczema, it gets rid of psoriasis, it gets rid of like, if you get your stomach swells out like right here at the top, yeah. that's all gluten. Um, it was gluten and dairy were the big ones for me. And it got to the point where I understood my body so much that my relationship with food changed. And I saw it as fuel rather than something I did when I was bored or tried to fill a void with it or whatever. I really like started to pay attention. Like what, what is it that I want this for? What do I think this is going to do for me right now? Right. And I learned the difference between satiated and full. Because we're trained in this country to eat until we're full, which is like a stomach sensation. And I would eat until I was sweating and like like nauseous and the room was spinning. And then as that awful feeling would just subside a little bit, I would go eat again. And I yeah. ate like that my whole life. You know what life. my mother says all the time? She goes, I want to have dessert now because if I wait, I'll be full. Yeah. <laughs> and then I won't want it. She's like, give me the cake and the ice cream now because if I wait, I'll be full and I won't want it. And uh, <laughs> healthy food attitudes, dude. I swim. You want to talk about fat, <laughs> which is such a you can't grow up under boomers without usually some bad food because boomers Oof. did not usually cook. You did not sit down at no. 6 p.m. and have a meal. You got fast food. You ordered pizza. You, it was grab and go. You were going to sports or whatever you were at. I was on swim team. I was on all these things. And I was an actor. I was a play practice or wherever. And you just, everybody's doing something, right? And nobody's made time to sit down and have a meal. Nobody's preparing anything. Nobody's cooking any food. So we're at Wendy's. We're at Taco Bell, KFC, Boston Market, McDonald's. We're pizza, Chinese, diner, fish house. We're eating. And, you know, you were talking about fat. I swam a mile. So I've never felt better in my life than when I was six. Okay. That's really after the, I'm dead serious. Six years old was it. Now, when I was six, I was training for the mile swim in Island Park, New York. We used to have Labor Day races. Uh, you, you, you grew up near the water? Yeah. Delaware, Rehoboth Beach. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did you ever swim? Were you ever involved in any of the beach shit? No. Okay. I mean, I've swam. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> I'm a little bit of an athlete. I'm trying to. <laughs> I was, actually. When I was six, I was training for the mile swim. I wanted to swim the mile swim. My parents were like, okay. My mother, all these Labor Day races were big deal. She took five kids. I would all swim in the canal every morning at like 530 in the morning. We'd all put these lifeguard floats on us. And you were swimming with like sand sharks. We'd like swim next to like, And you felt you would swim and the sun would come up. And you would like jump in the water when it was almost it was still dark. And the water would come up. And we'd see a few people, like a few people do that every fucking day. Every day they would swim. And I would get out of that water and I never felt better than starting my day like that. And then I swam the mile swim. It was great. 
I never felt better than when I was pushing my body. Yeah. Like that. I did it from six to like probably 10 or 11. I was a swimmer and I swam every day. I would swim in pools. I was on a swim team. I was like, very good. I was like the third fastest long. There was always this one kid I couldn't beat. Brian something. Pernice or something, whatever. If you were, well, this is a Patreon episode, so that that would be. I'm going to say it on a public episode too. If you were the kid in the late 90s that was the fastest butterfly in Long Island, you had like a French name, and you're not dead from a heroin overdose, <laughs> but contact me. Because it was a kid that always used to beat me. We didn't really even know each other. He was just on the block, two blocks down. He would always beat me. Um, what do you think we did after the mile swim? Uh, Dairy Queen? Bitch. No. <laughs> we, went, we went to a place with all those five kids after I finished the mile swim. <laughs> And I got like a whatever medal and I, I won gold in a few other events. We went to an ice cream parlor called Itkins in Valley Stream. And we had the, they call it the socket to me Sunday, everything but the kitchen sink. It yeah. was a 15 scoop Sunday that they put on the table with every topping, every flavor. And me and these five kids gorged ourselves till we were sick. Yeah. I it's- mean- I don't let my kids have sugar. They get very little sugar. It's not like crazy. I was over the house the other night. And what's interesting is that you don't let them have that shit. Right. But you did let them do shrooms. Yeah. And I think that's, <laughs> and I thought that was very progress. No, there's no sugar. In you don't, shrooms. you don't, you don't, you are good like that. And you, and I'll eat stuff like every now and then Jess will make food for kids and then I'll have it. And then uh, I'll take it right off their plate. You know, the little, little, <laughs> the little one, they're so high. The little one is, this. uh, the little one's cute. She's a, she's going to be, I feel like the older one is just sweet and the little one's got a little, do you feel that? The little one's like spunky. If you really get into a conversation with the she's older very sweet. one, she's brilliant. And no, I know that. Scary. But that's, smart. but that's what I mean. Yeah. I think the little one's going to be the, the leather jacket. Yeah. Wearer. Yeah. Like that, you know, like, Hey mom, I'm going out. Yeah. Like that, you know, mm-hmm. Um, the, the other one's smarter than like anyone I know, you know? Um, but you are so hyper-focused on them eating clean. Yes. And then that's cause we grew up with shit. I don't want them to have to spend 30 something years figuring out their relationship with food. Yeah. Like I had to. Yeah. And if you don't introduce the older one, didn't have sugar, until she was three. And I just steered clear of it at birthday parties. And it's just not that big of a deal. If you don't make a big deal out of it, especially in LA, everyone will accommodate you. It's a lot easier now, even right. than it was then they can't have gluten either. They would just projectile vomit yeah, every the time they birthday eat parties it. in LA. Like the kids are doing ayahuasca. Exactly. No <laughs> I mean, it's a whole different thing. And, but once they've like gone that long without having sugar, they don't crave it. And when my kids eat sugar immediately afterwards, they're like, Oh, I'm nauseous from the sugar. They know it's sugar. They're not binging on sugar and it's, they're having like real sugar, not like high fructose corn syrup. And it would be crazy to me when I would watch other people like let their kids drink soda, which is some insane amount. I never did. I never liked soda. Thank God. Soda. And then like, uh, you know, crazy candy, like can- Skittles and shit with a right. bunch of fucking sugar in it. And then they're like, I don't know. I think they have like ADD or something. It's like, no, they're fucking high. Right. How do you feel after you eat 50 grams of sugar? That's twice an adult dose of sugar. Right. And I'm not just saying this is some hippy dippy mom. I just didn't want them to become food addicts, but their like mood regulation is so much better than kids who eat sugar. Kids who throw like crazy fucking tantrums. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you let them have, Enough sugar that would freak you the fuck out, and they They're can't like handle addicts. it. Yeah, my mother gave me speeches about how McDonald's was healthy. <laughs> my, my mother said to me, "She goes, I've never been healthier than when I was eating fast food." She used to say that to my grandmother. She goes, "I was never healthier than when I was eating fast food." And she goes, "You know, she'd go do Atkins, and then they would give her the dirty McDonald's patties without Ugh. just in a box and stuff." And it was like, let's, I mean, but then my uncle was a director of operations for this big steakhouse chain in New York, Smith and Walensky's. So then I graduated to big martinis, big ribeyes, shellfish towers, cream spinach, 
And this idea of like doing well meant you went out and had big dinners and, and abused yourself in every way possible. And it was just so bad. Yeah, I think just real food. I'm not, I mean, you've been at my house when we're having like organic tater tots and right. gluten-free chicken nuggets because I am not a housewife right. anymore. I'm not a, a kept woman, so I don't get to just uh, sit around and, and cook ribeyes and, and fresh vegetables anymore. But I, if it's, it just has to be real food. So we don't ever, like my kids have never had fast food. And that's mostly a huge pain in the ass. It's very inconvenient if you're on the road, but it would make them sick now because they've never had it. We get past fast food. Is that part of the new consciousness? Because it is disgusting. It is gross. It is not good. Are people ever going to wake? It seems like people are waking up a little bit. Yeah. Well, because the new body, your body's also changing. You're getting a, a, a higher dimensional body and this is where it gets pretty weird, but your body is turning into something that will not die and will not get disease and will not decay. So it, is probably coming to the point for a lot of people where they're having a ton of symptoms and that is your body shorting out because it's it's it it can't run on this shit it can't run on this garbage and so it's manifesting as these like chronic pain diseases and you know and I don't want to get and I don't think your audience would give a shit I don't want nasty emails about that but it's upgrading and it needs the fuel that matches and then now your new book if you have cancer it's your fault <laughs> We'll be out. That's coming out next week. Uh, you know? Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's probably all bullshit. To, to wrap up, because we're going to have you back, and we love you, and we're, 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 we're such big fans of you, and everybody can, you know, at the end, we'll have people, you can tell everyone where to find you, and you've got every, a million things going on. You've got a lot of interesting stuff, and when you break it down, it's not as crazy as it all sounds. I mean, some of it does sound wild. Yeah. But this idea of just, Conquering your trauma, developing empathy, learning how to relate to people, envisioning a new reality. Stop involving your old reality. Mm -hmm. Stop involving Trump in the new reality. Stop involving your fat or your addictions or your problems in the new reality. Now, there's ways to work through all this stuff, and there's great programs out there. And I was in the rooms in AA, and I know that you're not against the rooms. The rooms aren't everything, but in the beginning, they help a lot of people. There's a lot of great programs and and teachers out there. Um, But what would you say? If there's people out there that want to change their life and what is the biggest first step they can do? Let's say they're swimming in debt or let's say they have food problems or it's a drug problem or whatever. What do you think is the biggest? And obviously, if you're suicidal or whatever, you could got to get help. But like, what is the biggest thing you can do to change your begin to change your life? Because you're somebody who's changed their life in a in, in an amazing way. I think number one is you have to figure out what it is that you want and not what you think you have to have, not what you think you're worthy of, not what society tells you, not what your parents expect of you, not your obligations, not your guilt, not your shame. What is it that you want? Because a lot of people are waiting for some fantasy lottery ticket or something, or they they have a, a vague idea of the timeline that they want. But when you ask them to really like, tell me what it looks like, they don't know. They just know they don't like this. And so I think the first thing you have to do is figure out what you want. Put it down on paper. And I'm not talking about a fucking vision board. Put it down on paper and then listen to the voices in your head that come up when you say like, I would like to be, if money didn't exist, I have to tell people if money didn't exist because they've been trained to believe that life is about survival. What a brilliant fucking lie to right. tell a bunch of gods. And so you tell people like, what would you be doing right now if money didn't exist? And they have no fucking answer to that. And then they were like, well, I would just go hang out on the beach. And I'm like, okay, but that's, you wouldn't. You do that for a couple of weeks and you get fucking bored. So like, what do, what do you want? What do you want from this life? You live in an abundant universe where you can have anything you want and you've just been lied to forever and told that it's otherwise. What do you want? And they would say, oh, I'd like to make music for a living. And then I am, then listen to the next thing that pops up in your head when you think that. Because uh, it's another- me, It's me telling you yeah. not to. <laughs> <laughs> just as long as it's not comedy. <laughs> yeah, don't do comedy. Um, and there are, I don't know, there's a lot. It depends on kind of what level you're on, but uh, that's a big one. Figure out what you want first. Yeah, I think that's a big one. Then listen to my podcast and, and 
get the advice for the where rest can of it. people find you um you can find me at mormon and the meth head is my main podcast start at the very first episode that will walk you through a bunch of the emotional clearing type stuff if you're into the real kind of alien school shit that's this far out and a little bit further listen to soberish my other podcast it was an addiction podcast for three episodes yeah <laughs> And then you see Yours I, is one of them, the most yeah. successful episode, we call it. And after that, it gets pretty far out with this shit. Yeah. And then if you want a reading or a counseling session, I guess, is what they You're usually You're a fascinating person. One of the things that I like about you is that everybody right now is so fucking, they're talking about the same shit. Everything is politics, it's money, it's whatever, it's the economy, and everybody's just banging the same drum. We're in a cycle, mass yeah. shooting. Charlize Theron plays a black person. <laughs> uh, you know, Trump says something. Uh, you know, uh, there's a fight about whether a Marvel character is portraying the. I mean, it's literally. I mean, literally. It is a you, loop. If you go back for the last few years, we're in a fucking loop. Individuality has been like almost erased, and people are legitimately thinking that. This is all there is. And what's good about your shit is I think you wake people up and you go, you don't have to participate. You can be aware of it, but you don't have to participate. You can actually do whatever you want. Yeah. And there's an entire world out there. You don't have to live in this country. You don't have to live in your town. Your family, if they're not good for you, you don't have to spend time with them. You don't have to be in these destructive relationships. You don't have to be in these destructive feedback loops. And you can get out of it. And I just look at Twitter and I'm like, it's a disease. Yeah. I really look at some of these social media platforms and I go, this is a fucking disease. And maybe if we look at it in another way, in a positive way, maybe it's growing pains. Well, some of it is the the people that we talk shit about, you know, or we make fun of. Yeah. The, um, they are an energy. They are like a collective sent to pave the way for the new world. So yeah. We talk about how cannibalistic yeah. these people are, but they but were described to me. Because they're tearing down some of these systems. They're tearing down the old systems, but they just like, they're just like Pac-Man. They're just looking for the energy of the old world. And so they tear down each other and everything else because they're just like a computer program or something designed to tear down the old world. They took down the patriarchy. Like they changed our perception and the way that we view so many systems in such a short period of time, but that's of course going to be, you know, uh, innately annoying to be around because we are like the nuance crew, you know, yeah. we're here for the, all right, let's smooth things out afterwards. So it's not going to be a good energy reality. For us. What's it going to be? 5d, 8d. It'll eventually be eight. When we're in 8d, will people be able to say the N word? <laughs> Uh, yes, would it be telepathically? What is the answer? <laughs> That's a question. A legitimate question. I don't think, you don't I don't know? Think so. mm -mm. You say still no? <laughs> still no. We go to 8D. <laughs> we get rid of all the trauma and the pain. We're not going to have words. Okay. All right. Well, way to get out of that one. <laughs> We're not going to have words. Uh you fuckers all know where to find me if you want. Tim J. Dillon, D-I-L-L-O-N, Instagram, Twitter. Thank you. Ray Kump is coming next week. Relax. It's going to be fun. Jessa Reed, amazing, really great shit. Go find her on all her stuff. Goodbye. <laughs>